Well, good afternoon, Hillcrest. Uh, the, uh, the Bible passage that I wanted to speak about this afternoon is found in the third chapter of Zephaniah. Uh, it's another one of those passages that uh, you've no doubt heard me refer to uh, multiple times um, since uh, I've been here at Hillcrest. Uh, Zephaniah is uh, one of the minor prophets. It's one of my one of my favorite minor prophets. Uh, actually, like all of them, they're all very unique and different, but uh, um, this one in particular is one of my favorites. Um, like many of the prophets and many of the, the minor prophets, it's a message of um, impending judgment against Jerusalem, against Judah, against God's people, particularly because um, of their, their breaking the covenant. Um, and then there's, in, in Zephaniah 1, there's this uh, uh, description of God's people, the people there in Jerusalem, uh, worshiping uh, Baal and Astra and, and other things um, that, that this uh, apostasy has um, swept through even God's people, even there in, in Jerusalem, in, in the city of Zion. And that the day of God's judgment is proclaimed in the book of Zephaniah as being near, as, as coming down upon God's people. That God is going to, uh, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment against God's enemies, but when God's own people, uh, when they rebel against their God, when they worship other gods, when they fall away from him, they are placing themselves into the category of the enemies of God. And so Judah, by her apostasy, has, um, has placed uh, all those in Jerusalem who are worshiping Baal and others, they have placed themselves in that category of God's enemies. And so when the day of judgment comes, God's wrath is going to fall upon them um, as well because, again, they've, they've rebelled against their God. They have rejected him. But in the midst of all of this, here in, in chapter 3, uh, the Lord says this, starting in verse 8, Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. So this is a picture then of that great last day, the day of wrath, the day that we see pictured in the book of Revelation, where God gathers the nations together and pours out his wrath upon them. But then I want to notice what, where, where he goes with this in verse 9 and following. For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord, from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in the holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a, hu a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel. They shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, for they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. What, what God is saying here is that even as he gathers together all of the nations and he pours out his wrath, that in a very similar way, it's almost like he's shifting his metaphors to, to think about the sifting of the wheat or um, or the, the the purifying of silver or gold in the furnace that that what that it's the chaff ultimately that is being blown away by his wrath it is the dross that is ultimately being melted away by his anger so that what is left is a people who love God a people who are devoted to him a people who are not mixed in with those who uh, run after the bales and the astros and everything else and so it is a picture then both of judgment, but, but really a judgment that has a purpose. It, it is a purpose of purifying the gathered nation so that there's nothing left but those who love God, those who worship him, those who are seeking to serve him. But then it, it, it continues just to get more and more marvelous because in verses 14 and following we read this, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, 
Rejoice and exult with all of your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said in Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all of your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in. At that time I will gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortune before your eyes, says the Lord. Here the Lord is making this marvelous promise to his people that on that day, however much they they suffer, and we do, we suffer as we were saying on Sunday uh, Sunday morning, uh, we see in one sense, every time we open scripture, we, we are reminded that uh, we are a people who were marked by the sufferings of Christ. Uh, he suffered on our behalf, but in union with him, we, we share in those sufferings. But God is saying no matter, no matter how bad those sufferings are, and for some of us they're, they're extraordinarily bad, that there is a marvelous reality to which God is calling all of us to wait patiently until this day when he is taking away all of our judgments, when he clears away all of our enemies, when he is in our midst, when there is no more evil, when he restores to us the, our fortunes before our eyes, when he, when he gathers us together, when he makes us renowned and praised amongst all the peoples of the earth, and what's perhaps to me most amazing about all of this is the things that, that uh, Zephaniah says in verse 17. That on this marvelous day when God gathers all of his people together and, and, and sifts away the chaff of unbelief and, and, and burns away the dross of, of idolatry and, and sin, that, that God is in our midst. He is a mighty one who will save. And then this marvelous promise that God is going to rejoice over us with gladness. That, that God is going to quiet us by his love. That he is going to exult over us with loud singing. I, I often hear people say, you know, the first thing I'm going to say when I, when I see Jesus face to face is, and then it's something. Maybe it's a question, maybe it's a comment, whatever it is. And Zephaniah is saying that the first thing that's going to happen when we see Jesus face to face is he's actually going to, to close our mouths. And, and he is going to exult over us with joy, with gladness. Uh, that he's not going to sit back and receive praise and adoration from us. He is going to sing over us. He is going to exult over us with these loud songs. He is going to be so overjoyed that this one, that that one has come home. That like the father and the prodigal son, he's going to, to rush to meet us and to, to clothe us and to celebrate a sinner has returned. It is a marvelous picture of the marvelous love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not only that he would accomplish the fullness of all of this that Zephaniah is speaking about, that he would, that he would make those promises, that he would secure the reality of all of these things to happen even on the last day, but that he would give us this, this picture into God's zeal for us, his love for us, his compassion toward us, that that he longs for that day when he can rejoice, that he can be glad, that he can, he can quiet us with his love. My friends, uh, particularly today, particularly on these days where you know, things are difficult, right? I mean, you're still hearing from me over the internet because this is the, the best way for me to talk to all of you. 
and we're not meeting face to face, that we need this reminder that that what we're really looking forward to is not even what we get to do for God. Um, however much we may long for that day when we're gathered together around the throne of grace and we're singing with all of the saints throughout all of history as we wait for the day when Jesus returns, we're singing holy, holy, holy with all of them over and over and over again. However much that may be something we long for. Or the thing you hear, you know, I can't wait till I get to heaven, I'm going to go find so-and-so. So I can talk to them or ask them or whatever else. All, all of that, 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 that's marvelous, that's good. We ought to hope for those things. We ought to long for those things. But God wants to remind us is that however much you might be looking forward and should be looking forward to that day, that it's a day that he is preparing in advance to sing over you to exult over you, to rejoice in your coming home and, and to, to, to quiet you. What, what a marvelous picture. Um, it, it doesn't, I mean, again, it doesn't mean he's like, you know, holding his hand over our mouth and saying that he doesn't, he doesn't care to listen to us. He has something he wants to say. That, that's not the point. The point is, is that his love is going to be so palpable on that day that all questions, all comments will be quieted in our hearts. We will see him face to face. As Paul says, right, we, we, will, we will see him as he truly is. We will become as he is because we will see him face to face. And any notion of what I would say is swallowed up in love, is swallowed up in song. And not our song, not our song, but his song. And so, brothers and sisters, as we await that day when we can gather together as God's people to worship him together and, 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 and are looking forward with, with anticipation, right, to be able to hear one another sing and to hear the prayers of the saints and everything else, remember that there is a day that the Lord has prepared in which he will sing over us. He will exult over us. He will quiet us with his love. Let us look forward to that day. Let's long for that day, uh, even as we wait patiently upon him uh, in the midst of our present circumstances. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you that you in this passage remind us of your grace, of your glory, of your love. Uh, yes, indeed, Father, you remind us in these words of your um, your wrath against sin, and particularly, Father, your wrath against all of those who would rebel against you, who would reject you. But oh, how deep is the love that you have for your people? How deep is that reflect, reflected here in this passage? And Father, we pray that even as we contemplate that day when you will sing over us, when you will rejoice over us, when you will quiet us with your love, we pray, Father, that 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 joy, that peace, that hope would settle into us now and that we would live now in light of that reality. Now grant us these things we pray, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. God keep you. And I look forward to coming back and speaking to you guys again this coming uh, Thursday. God bless.